This is the first half of Chapter 5 of The American Home Front, 1941-1942, by Alistair Cook. The Gulf Coast The airplane rises in the twilight and heads north and west to the Gulf Coast. Behind us is the glassy ocean, with the lights of Miami Beach frothing to its edge like scummy bubbles. As we gain altitude, the twinkling coast fades into memory, and we look down on the inky, drowned plain of the Everglades. For the first time on this trip, I pass through a landscape that suggests no connection with the war, or even with human society. For the first time, I can feel the eerie emotional privacy that is the special quality of certain regions of the West. The map tells us that we are, in fact, still east of Raleigh, North Carolina, of Roanoke, Virginia, even east of Rochester, New York. But the Everglades are akin to Zion, and the Grand Canyon, and the Black Hills at night. A geographer may maintain that these are measurable parcels of marsh or limestone. But to a traveler born in a temperate zone, they are kingdoms of the imagination, vast fantasies in the mind of God, that a man may analyze at his peril. You reflect that a Navajo or a Seminole probably feels quite different, and that to him they are the cozy habitation of hearth and home and a warm supper. You wrestle with this mystery a little longer, and decide that all you are saying to yourself is that, to an Anglo-Saxon, a deciduous tree is the anchor of reality, and when it is no longer there, the rest is chaos and black night. Comforted to have analyzed something that seemed poetic, and to have watched in turn into a prejudice, I can look down again and bear to admit that there is a perfectly scientific recipe for the concoction of a swamp as awful as Milton's hell. Down there somewhere, in the stinking ocean of weed and mud, are slender egrets standing near honeysuckle, alligators sloshing through a wilderness of cypress, and rising from purest muck, orchid trees that bear a thousand blossoms. But from the plain, all you can see round to the purple rim of the horizon is a sedgy lake floating with lily pads. We are low enough to scan through glasses, what look like islands of matchsticks. They are the houses of Seminole Indians, on stilts high above the water. The pilot reports that, because of their traditional mastery of sky signs and the happy accident of their domestic architecture, the Seminoles have been signed up as airplane spotters. It is a pleasing thought that, while you are peering down through binoculars at these tamed inmates of the swamp, they are also skeptically focusing on you, with the full encouragement and authority of the Office of Civilian Defense. A fellow passenger looks down gloomily and says he never did understand why the federal government or anybody else should want to enclose the Everglades into a national park. Park, he exclaims, just look at it, just a mess of muck and sand. A small, wiry man, a Texan, remarks that, on the contrary, there's good sugar cane and wild rice down there. They raise an average of 19,000 acres. This year the government is asking them for more. I was cheered by the thought that somebody in Washington keeps a careful file on this ocean of dirt and works from nine to five, arranging for a poor white or an Indian, or a fugitive from his draft board, to reclaim an acre of mud for Uncle Sam. The first man is not so easily comforted. You ever driven through it? says the Texan. No, sir, he replies, and I hope never to. Every time I fly over here, I just pray to God the pilot knows which way he's going. After a while, he rubs his cheek restlessly with the palm of his hand and sighs. Oh, I don't know. Maybe when I retire, I'll feel different. He confesses that since the war began, he has been a chronic insomniac, waking with a start and wondering how many boats I lost last night. He operates a fleet of tankers round the Gulf and up to New Jersey. The Texan asks him how many boats does he run. He says with a long face, Well, I have twelve. At least this morning I had twelve. 
By the time I get to New Orleans, I reckon I'll have eight or maybe nine. I had twenty three months ago. He says if the government doesn't do something about that pipeline up from Texas to New York and Pennsylvania, I'll settle for a little Caribbean trade and dump the cargo of coffee or whatever at Key West and the hell with oil. We ask him about signing up a crew for all his tankers, and he says sorely, might just as well advertise for suicides. Fifty percent of a crew you pick up in Galveston or New Orleans either quit when they reach New Jersey and take a train home, or they finish the round trip and go look for a job in a shipyard. Can you blame them? Every night I wait for a phone call from New Jersey. They don't stand a chance. These submarine commanders know the Atlantic coast better than we do. Two weeks ago, one of my boats was hit and inside a few minutes the sub comes up to the surface. The commander shouts across if any of my men are hurt. In English. Sure, in English. Well, there was one fellow with his leg pretty badly smashed. They rode him over to the sub, and the Nazis picked him up and went to work on him. Operated on him, dressed him, and everything. About an hour later, they lifted him back up, and our fellows took him back into the rowboat. The tanker was almost sunk by this time, and the crew that was still alive was in two rowboats. Just before the Nazis submerged again, the commander yells out, Any of you boys from Brooklyn? Well, naturally, they had said nothing. Then the commander shouts, Maybe I worked with some of you guys. I was twelve years in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. So long, he says. Can you tie that? We had passed over Charlotte Harbor, and though it was dark down there below, the sparse lights of small towns were dotted at familiar intervals. Ahead, on our left, we saw St. Petersburg, and the oil man breathed a happy sigh as we droned over Tampa Bay and came down at Tampa. Between here and the East Coast is citrus country, the core of any stable prosperity that Florida has ever known. Waking the next morning in Clearwater and driving along a waterfront brilliant with flowers, the oil man's anecdote of the night before seemed like a guilty dream and submarines a dirty European joke. In Dunedin, the dense scent of oranges wafted into oblivion any further preoccupation with sinking tankers. Near a small factory, you wonder why this smell should be so powerful, and finally appreciate that it comes from a plant working to concentrate orange juice for shipment to Britain and Russia. If there were no submarines, there might have been no pressing reason to concentrate the juice of oranges that in the last war would have been shipped whole. And once again, you are made to recognize that a war economy is not a separate study of generals and munitions makers and economists in Washington and London working on supply. It is the whole economy of a nation at war. My trip so far has demonstrated in bewildering detail that if you look carefully enough into any part of the nation's economy, into the manufacture of gloves or the marketing of camellias, you will learn about profound changes that only the war could make. The plant that carries the important title Citrus Concentrates Incorporated is a ramshackle assortment of low buildings throbbing in a series of Joe Cook rhythms and held together by rusty screws worn rubber tubing, and the fantastic ingenuity of its research director, Dr. Robert James. He is a gawky, raw redhead, a small, determined chemist who sports a toothbrush mustache, a perpetual wry frown, and a deputy sheriff's badge at his belt. To the shopkeepers and waiters in the taverns of Dunedin and Clearwater, he is known reverentially as the professor. To the orange growers, he is a humorous, alarming reformer and the most puzzling of the wartime gifts from Washington. The fact that he is a Republican and an active agent of the Department of Agriculture alternately cheers and depresses them. For when he came down here, not many months ago, he told a meeting of the Citrus Commission to begin with that the economics of the citrus industry is crazy, and you know it. You have to gather the fruit crop as cheaply as possible, because you have to figure in the cost of packing, shipping, and distributing. You are jittering on the verge of bankruptcy, because all you know is the worth of an orange as saleable orange juice up north. Most of you are well aware that 97% of the oranges you ship north are used only for their juices. 
I'm simply here to tell you that we're bringing this industry into the state, not to crowd you out, but to make orange growing a profitable undertaking. All I'm here to prove is that the part of the orange you throw away, the pulp, the peel, the seeds, the rag, is worth many times the value of the juice. If you won't see it on your own initiative, then the war and the government are going to have to make you realize it. Some of you who've been in the citrus game for 30 years or more may have the notion that all we do is concentrate the juices, but that's only the beginning. If it isn't too painful to recall what it costs you to pack and ship your fruit, you may be interested to know that we could take the entire citrus crop of Florida, concentrate the juices, and store it in a single warehouse in the port of Newark, and for one-tenth of what it costs you to get it up there. Orange juice is almost a minor byproduct of what we do with your spoilage. If you think I'm down here to tell you how to run your business, you're right. Dr. James approaches the reformation of the citrus industry with all the bigotry of a convert. He has been a research director for Park Davis and then for DuPont when he was won over to the exciting and far-reaching work that the Department of Agriculture was doing in a hundred fields. My God, he cries, if they'd only advertise, if only they'd tell people what they are doing, they simply don't know how to publicize the tremendous work they're doing. Thoroughly agitated by the prospect of citrus concentration, Dr. James came down to Florida and found a humble factory working with three lab assistants and practically no equipment. He got a small appropriation to run the place as a government project. And ever since, while steel plants and airplane factories and ordnance plants have been constructed of beautiful and durable materials denied for the duration to civilians, Dr. James has had to bum an old Bunsen burner here, a length of copper wire or low-grade lumber there, has had to make distillation units out of rubber bands and old bottles, but he got citrus concentrates incorporated, booming into sizable production of all the things he had promised for the Citrus Commission. Above all, his job was to help meet the British demand for orange juice, which they needed, as the children of the occupied countries are going to need it as a vital protection against scurvy. The British wanted the juice, but did not have the shipping space for whole oranges, nor did the United States. So under Lend-Lease, the U.S. government ships, say, 10,000 gallons of the concentrated orange juice. The British receive it and add seven parts of water, and thus have 80,000 gallons of orange juice that is not exactly whole, but close enough to the original to be very welcome. But this is, to Dr. James, only the routine by-product. Once the juice is out, Dr. James and his staff are left with the peel, pulp, rag, and seeds. With alcohol and acetone, they extract from the seeds a dye mordant that will fix any known color in artificial silk. The only other known oil that will do this is tea seed oil, and Dr. James adds waggishly that it's a Japanese monopoly, and you may have heard that we are not doing the same type of business with them as we used to. In these seeds, too, are some residual fats from which they extract oleomargarine and some vegetable fats for cooking. After the juice is expressed, the peel is left with a pigmented layer and some whitey pulp. By continuous distillation processes, they recover from the colored layer terpenes and carotene. The Navy uses the terpenes for marine paints, for a paint hard enough to use on battleships. Carotene is the start of vitamin A, and from the process used at Dunedin, Dr. James gets an annual production running into trillions of units. From the remaining white pulp, they treat the albedo to get pectin, a superlative gelling agent now being used by every modern army in the early treatment of deep wounds. What is left over is largely cellulose and sugar, from which they extract ethyl alcohol for making smokeless powder, the vitamin B complex, feed yeast for cattle. And when all these are removed, there is left an activated carbon, which can be used in war for gas masks, in peace for absorbing unpleasant smells, and an extract available for dried milk and dried eggs. There remains, says the undefeatable Dr. James, 
alpha cellulose, which we mix with some of the other products to give us cellophane, a very tough cellophane. In other words, we make the orange provide its own gelling agent in the pectin, and its own container, moreover, a container that's waterproof and gasproof that'll carry the juices better than any tin can ever did. You leave this tumble-down house of magic, prepared to believe that Florida belies its mystical setting and superstitious history, and is the laboratory of the new hygienic world. But as we drive away, the sputtering motor of a loaded truck is the bridge passage between the heavy silence of the groves, where the humble orange ripens unconscious of its reincarnation in the distillations of Dr. James. From the end product to the beginning is only 100 yards or less, and as the truck rumbles away into the distance, another sound drifts up over the vegetable palms. It is a handful of negroes trudging with their sacks up and down the orange groves, singing with a wistful monotony. Bread of heaven, bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. We are restored to the intervening norm, to the well-meaning amateur hopes of middle-class human beings, by a lunch in clear water. On the cafe tables are camellias sparkling with dew. An old lady with silver hair dips her spoon into a fragrant mess of fresh peaches, grapefruit, orange, and melon, and remarks, They say the famine in Poland is worse than the last war. No, her companion retorts with well-bred incredulity. And they step out delicately into a garden of azaleas. Here and elsewhere, going north on Route 19, you hear murmurs of admiration for brave General MacArthur, whose colored picture is displayed in store windows, parlors, and the lobbies of hotels. Up past Palm Harbor, the orange and grapefruit groves are protected from the wind by high, stiff rows of Australian pine. We come to the outskirts of a small seaport town, whose streets are paved with bricks. And suddenly, on our left, the sky is penciled with a long cluster of sailless masts. It is the sponge-fishing fleet of Tarpon Springs. The bows of a hundred boats of many colors are tied to the docks, and Greek fishermen are busy painting and mending them. They bear names like Andros, Amarkos, Fanny C. Angeli, and Franklin Roosevelt. Halfway along the dock there are a wooden hut and a board barring entrance to the boatyards. In the name of the U.S. government, unauthorized persons are forbidden to enter. The sponge fleet is now working on a government contract, and the Greeks standing around and chatting quietly are courteously uninformative about what goes on in there. Only the youngest of them talk American, but there are few minorities in the country so unprotestingly patriotic as the Greeks. They insist on making their own living and running their own stores, with a minimum of interference from town or state government but they are obviously very impressed by the honor of working on a war contract. Of all professions, the sponge fishermen have most right to dramatize their work. But their traditions do not run the advertising copywriters, and while the war is on, and afterwards, few Americans are likely to know what a thing it is to ask them for an extra effort. The fleets, however, have been told by the government that most of their perilous haul will go to the armed forces, and that what is expected of them is a record harvest for the duration. C. P. Rodokanachi, in Forever Ulysses, has memorably described the daily round of a sponge fisherman's life, and it will serve as a hint of the measure of their war contribution. Quote, their life is an endless struggle with death. On the surface they fight against the waves, and in the depths against sharks, against suffocation, and against the paralysis brought on by the terrible pressures they endure, when, weighted with a heavy stone, they descend ever further and further down, even to forty fathoms deep. The sponge once plucked, they leave their stone and rebound to the surface. 
Such is the pressure with which they remount to the boat that they are flung several yards into the air to fall into the water again like bleeding phantoms, drawn on board almost inanimate, sweating blood through all their pores, convulsed and panting. This is the cost of the soft sponge that we use so thoughtlessly, and the sanguinary price is always paid by the miserable Greeks who have the sad monopoly of this accursed trade. End quote. This, it has to be admitted, describes the trade as it has been practiced for several thousand years. It is typical that Tarpon Springs, the American capital of the industry, should have devised a trick or two to moderate the traditional suffering. The colony here was established in 1905, soon after the equipment for deep-sea divers had been perfected. And the present generation feels at once superior to the European practitioners and grateful to their new country for reducing the hazards of their work. But the game still calls for stubborn courage and grueling physical endurance. And every time the fleet goes out, a priest of the Orthodox Church blesses each boat. And when the fleets turn homeward at Easter, the Thanksgiving services are held. The invention of diving equipment has not pacified the gulf storms or made the prayers of wives and mothers less devout. We went out on a new road through semi-tropical brush, with slender blue flowers growing out of the parallel bayous. Wherever the country widened into cutover pine, black hogs and cattle roamed everywhere. We drove through cypress ponds, and in the late afternoon watched negroes standing up to their knees in swamp and catfishing with long poles. We were going up across the narrow neck of the peninsula, where, according to lobbying southerners in Congress, there is angry agitation for a Florida barge canal. But as the twilight descended, the countryside buzzed only with the eerie music of all the swamp flies and frogs. Nameless birds wheeled and squawked against the orange rim of the horizon. Till that dusk we climbed up to Tallahassee. Tallahassee is a state capital, and like most state capitals, its first interest is in the continuing promise of a pork barrel. Its index of health or normalcy is the number of its citizens on the state or federal payroll and it is more likely to become agitated in an election year in peacetime than in an off year in wartime. Consequently, the local problems of the war tend to get thought of as exercises in political science. I talked with a citizen or two who held, or had held, city appointments. They considered the possibility of an air raid entirely as a prospective test case between federal and state administrations. They were suspicious of the Office of Civilian Defense. They thought very little of Mr. LaGuardia's plan to organize civilian defense municipally through a Congress of Mayors. They modestly drew attention to the forthrightness of Southerners and admitted they couldn't think of a better plan than the one Florida had evolved, which gave the supreme authority to the government to appoint statutory officers who had summoned county authorities, Red Cross officials, and the local chapters of the American Legion, to work in harmony, if by chance, the Nazis touted long-range bombers should descend on Tallahassee. Under direct questioning, they confessed that if by chance a bomb should drop on the high sidewalks of Park Avenue, and then bounce into the gutter, it would provoke a state crisis of protocol for it seemed that both the mayor and the governor could legally claim authority over the sidewalks. But once the bomb lay simmering on the public, i.e. U.S. highway, both the sheriff and the Office of Civilian Defense might want to establish their authority. I suggested that the London Blitz had presumably simplified a good many problems in etiquette for the administration of the London County Council but the point was ignored as a light-minded irrelevance. The conversation then turned to Negroes, irritating as it must be to a native Southerner when a Yankee or other alien is around. And one man, who was affable, thoughtful, and politically wise, was ready to quiet my outlander's fears. 
The Negras, he said, are doing all right. In spite of what you read, they always have done. Since the war came, the Negras around here have taken care of most of the construction of cantonments and the like. If any of them thought they were doing badly, they just had to get a taste of a war boom and find themselves paying out to the American Federation of Labor. I've had Negras I know and like come to me in great distress. They were carpenters, bricklayers, and so on, and they just naturally took it for granted when the call came they'd be used to build the camps. When they went to sign on, they got in line and found themselves up against AF of L union leaders, asking them two, three, four hundred dollars initiation fees before they could start in working. Well, for some of them, it was their first taste of being treated like a white man, and they didn't like it. But I'm telling you, a lot of them paid up. That goes to show you. Now you notice the way they came to me, a white man, for help. He went on in measured and even uncomplaining tones. But I was not listening any longer. I recalled the almost psychic change that comes over you when you go south across the Virginia border and thence for a thousand miles and round the arc of the Gulf through a region rich in resources and in unkempt, disillusioned, but able labor. It is not hard to, or cynical to see why the South hugs the Democratic Party like a sickly child at the only breast it knows. It wants many more things from President Roosevelt, but with his help it can just about keep its head above water and gasp a little gratitude for the Farm Security Administration, the Home Owners Loan Corporation, and the other federal admissions that the incomes of the South are barbarously low. Because its incomes are low, no southern state can raise enough funds to match the federal grants. The South is the richest potential agriculture region of the continent. It cries for money to save itself from long abuses and make the potential a rich fact. It cries for materials on a fair exchange for its own manufactured goods, to develop its industries, to equip its ring of ports. Not many Southerners I talked with were deceived by the superficial boom of the war industries. They knew that the great shipyards and the new factories of the South would be, to the post-war hungry, mocking memorials, if, while the war is on, the fair principles of an equitable peacetime economy and permanent federal support for an industrial South were not guaranteed. As I thought of these things, I realized with a shock that, all through the South, Ever since the day I left Washington, I had never heard any election talk. I walked out cheerlessly into the warm night past giant magnolias and live oaks that, like the South itself, looked so grand and haunting from a distance, until you came close and see that Spanish moss is much like the dead fuzz that gathers under the beds. I walked up the main street for the human signs of war. Along a couple of city blocks, where the neon lights were, there was human material for a whole committee of sociologists and short story writers, to say nothing of irate parents and magistrates from the juvenile courts. There were hundreds of soldiers in the saloons, hanging around newsstands, soda fountains, backed up against walls laughing and brawling with girls. It was the most casual sort of crowd, and on the surface taking its innocent ease. But something strikes you that you have not noticed before. The girls are not professional horis, nor are they girls in their twenties, coupling off with the soldiers they like. They were fifteen-year-olds, mostly squat or thin or otherwise unattractive. They were girls whose favors, however childish, would never be competed for by the boys in their schools. They stood in twos and threes, surrounded by dozens of big, raw, joshing soldiers and they were getting the first tumble they ever had in their lives, and they were loving it. The new and grisly idea dawns on me that the fifteen-year-old unattractive girl might well be the debauchee of the Second World War. The next morning was fresh and spring-like, and driving west past fields of pursuit plains shining in the sun, I thought the native soldiery seemed more innocent and purposive than they had the night before. 
We hummed along on an asphalt road past hogs burrowing their snouts in the delicate blossom of cypress ponds. We ran parallel with old railroad tracks being reconditioned by Negro work gangs, and so came eventually to Panama City and turned south to the sea. Across the Bay Harbor, the sight of a fringe of flowers along the dunes touched off one of those casual fantasies that spring up without warning when you are driving silently along a strange landscape. The flower was rosemary, the flower of fidelity. And I thought again of last night's fifteen-year-olds, whose forebears must surely have been offered the first rosemary by English soldiers, who introduced it from their native land as the rarest exotic. In the intervening 179 years, it has had time to become as common as dandelion, and for a hundred miles, from here to Pensacola, it carpets the dunes and flats. All the way at our side was an incomparable beach, smooth as sugar, of the finest gypsum sand, shearing off into an aquamarine sea. It was a lovely beach, so empty of any objects suggesting time or place, that when we reached Santa Rosa Island, I stood by the water, and with a foreground of two coke bottles and a dead shark, confronted a dolly landscape of the finest Renaissance clarity. The reverie was disturbed the moment we entered Pensacola, which is no longer the red snapper capital of the country, but a town for tourists to explore the origins of Spanish America. Its name has been restored to the news tickers, as it was a quarter century ago, by the swarming activity of the naval air station. There are no more tourist trips to Fort Barrancas, for this is now part of the naval area. There were about 1,500 men training here and 700 Britons doing their primary basic and advanced flight training. It seemed a good place to observe the early relations between Britons and Americans, but I found it hard to make much contact with the young Britons, chiefly because by late afternoon the weather had reduced them to a coma. They lay prostrate in their club room, and in time ventured a guarded remark or two. They got along well enough with Americans, but they couldn't take the food. One said it was too spiced, another too fancy, another very hot and too many sauces. Another felt for an adjective and dropped his hands in despair. Evidently the whole experience was baffling in the extreme. Each of these boys had had his own private vision, inspired by the movies of what America was to be like, and each of them had probably hoped to live it out. But none of these visions contained cabbage palm, bayous, hominy grits, garlic, and North Felifox Street, all stewing hazily in a summer noonday temperature of 98 degrees. The Americans were equally discreet, perhaps by official advice, for there is no place where a civilian is less likely to hear uninhibited opinion than inside an army or navy camp. A young ensign summed up the general feeling. You could find most anything you wanted round here, I guess. Sure, maybe once in a while a Britisher and an American quarrel in a bar, and that's news, but the fact is seven hundred of them get along okay with us. Well, nobody's interested. That's not news. The boys from the air station had more or less taken the town over, and in the lobby of the Hotel San Carlos was a new sign. Every seat was taken by a waiting Navy wife. So far, the revival of the naval station and subsidiary shipyards had not produced a great invasion of workers from far away, but there was an appreciable influx of strangers from the North and the Midwest to have an interesting effect on the town's racial mores, which, for a southern town, have always been peculiar, and for all I know, unique. There is in Pensacola hardly such a thing as a Negro colony. There are sections where the inhabitants are predominantly white or Negro, but you may never be sure that the house next door is lived in by people of the same color as the inhabitants of the rest of the block. White families live alongside Negro families, with apparently no more racial consciousness than an everyday over-the-fence pride. The reason usually given is that the leading society of Pensacola has always been of Spanish blood, and that to this nation 
These fastidious distinctions of color are about as unimportant as the recognition of Jewish blood in the family is, or was, to an Italian. But the Pensacolans, like the Italians, have suffered from the influx of civilizing outlanders, and however humble the Midwestern and Northern families that had come down to work in the shipyards, few of them wished to be denied the mild pleasure of race superiority that they had heard was a compensation for living in the South. Accordingly, city officials and renting agents were beginning to try to coax white families marooned in a street of Negroes back into wholly white sections of the town. And Negroes were being asked if they wouldn't find it cozier to live exclusively among their own race. We turned on to US-90 and drove past many flying fields and out across cutover pine land into Mobile, the bay was dense with smoke from stacks by the shipyards, but the sense of what we vaguely call a city at war was everywhere camouflaged by spring blossoms pouring over every wall, bursting from every fence and cranny, thousands of azaleas making gracious all the grimy streets. The luxuriance was so overwhelming as to make Mobile seem like a well-ordered garden, blooming the war to shame and the senses were so drugged by it that I was prepared to give the town the benefit of any doubts about its contribution to the war and push on west along the coast road to New Orleans. If the reader is abashed by this nonchalance, let him sometime drive inch by inch around a continent and discover what mild excuses, fatigue, or impatience will provide for him when he wishes to pass up something that undoubtedly he should investigate. After Louisville, Atlanta, Jacksonville, Miami, Tallahassee, and Pensacola, the blossom of Mobile was like a camellia growing in a steel mill. I felt grateful for it and unwilling to know that behind each petal lay merchant vessels, destroyers, an aluminum plant, and the southeast air depot of the Army Air Corps. It sounds irresponsible enough, but it seems absurd not to confess it. Down from Mobile, the landscape grows handsome enough for a time to discourage further concern over the grubbing farmers of what, for a thousand miles, we had thought of as the typical South. A white cement road is always a buttress against depression. Fringing it was sifting spring foliage, well-kept fields, pecan trees, and, once again, fine stands of unhacked pine but there is always something to beckon you away from an escape into the natural scene. At Criola, half hidden by these same handsome pines, was a defense plant. At Pascagoula, a small but clattering shipyard, streams of workers' jalopies jammed the highway on the outskirts of the town. The magnificent live oaks fronting the gulf at Biloxi form a natural arch against the sky, but they cannot shut out the sight of trainer planes shuttling in and out of the Air Corps Technical Training School here. When the evening comes on again, the war shrinks to the width of the highway and your own thoughts. And I hardly noticed when we crossed the sluggish Mississippi and soon saw the dark water of Lake Pontchartrain to the west and so came at night into New Orleans. That ends the first half of chapter five, and thank you for listening.